try to sing this song. I'm going to try to translate it before I sing it. Because sometimes my accent is hard to understand a word. So I'm going to read it slowly so you know <clears throat> what I'm trying to say. The song says, In the middle of stormy weather, Jesus extends his hands. In the darkest hour, he shows me how to stand strong. No matter what sin I commit or how far I run from him, you call me child of yours always and show me a better way. Your death was sad and painful too. You freed me and made me whole. Jesus is the answer. In the middle of stormy weather, Jesus extends his hands. And in the darkest hour, he shows me how to stand strong. No matter what sin I commit and how far I run from him, you call the child of yours voice and show me a better way. shoes because I had no special speaking engagements and uh, running shoes. Anyways, here we are. Praise the Lord. It's beautiful to see you and to hear you. And that's all good. 
Now, what do we got up there? The seven churches of Revelation. Hmm. I've never spoken an awful lot in, directly in the book of Revelation. Uh, certainly quoted from various verses down through the years. And I suppose more concentrated on the seven churches. And, uh, but I think it's appropriate to bring that back into focus again in our generation, in our time. Largely because we need it. Secondly, because of the events of the world that are unfolding before our eyes. I remember the first time I ever heard of the book of Revelation, it was through my grandmother, Grace Jameson, and Jim's grandmother. Our mothers were sisters. And I was about trying to calculate, I think grandmother would have been maybe in her 50s at that time, and I was about eight years old. And visiting us out in Princeton, a little house, and she'd been reading her Bible, and I knew she, she was reading it. But one day she said, Donnie, that was my kid name, Donnie, I want you to read to the Bi from the Bible for me because uh, my eyesight isn't very good. I think I was being tricked. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that at the time, but I figured it out afterwards. And uh, she had me read the passage about the mark of the beast and the number of the beast, 666, and all these flying creatures and monsters that are in there. And Quite frankly, it scared me. And quite frankly, it still scares me. And well, it should. Because the times we sometimes look at casually, everything seems to be, you know, apart from COVID, which has been a real hassle, and it's, it's been a torment, and so many people have been sick and died, and still are dying. It's been bad, but you ain't seen nothing yet. Because it's going to get our conditions in the world, and then events that are unfolding, and they're, they're under the surface, and on the surface of things, there's so many wonderful things. I think of people helping people, although I felt sorry for Wayne when he fell down and nobody would help pick him up. Uh, so, not everybody has got a real loving heart. God bless you, Wayne. I had an experience like that too, so I totally identify. I was in Malaysia, I fell down because of some slippery, they don't have ice over there, but they do have slippery tiles on parts of the street. And I fell down and had people walking by just looking at me, going, yeah, yeah, you know what he's been into. <laughs> Anyhow, I understand. But it looks good on the surface, and I'm, I'm so impressed with some of the news of people helping in their own community, people who are, have to flee the fires, or they're sick from the smoke, and, and people are giving so much, and in kind and in money to help these folk. And that's so impressive and so wonderful. So, so we could actually miss what's happening under the surface in our world between countries and through the leaders of nations. So that's really why I want to talk about this tonight. And we'll see how far we get. Now, this Revelations book, I tell you, it doesn't look like a big book, but it's pretty big. And uh, so here we go. I'm going to read to you from the uh, Re book of Revelation. And I'm going to start, and I think you have that up there. You can follow better than just listening to me. That would be wonderful. And I'm reading from uh, verse 1 through 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. 
and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, Amen. and they also who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And one of the first I want to single out in this beautiful introduction from the Apostle John. It's verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. And emphasis on the last few words. For the time is near. The time is near. Amen. And it's nearer now than it was 2,000 years ago. The time is near. And some of you may be following many of the events of the world and the development over so many years now and it's getting more critical things are happening fast but let's see what uh, message jesus has and had for the seven churches of revelation now those were actual churches and they're bunched up fairly close together along the crescent of, of the ocean at that point in time which is now turkey you, did you know that that whole area is, is encompassing Turkey and I've been in Turkey I knew I was there because there was a herd of turkeys going down the road in front of me on the sidewalk <laughs> uh, and, and that's a true story by the way <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> to the church in Ephesus now it's singled out from here that there were some good things and some dubious and unfortunate things in each of the almost all of these churches and the thing that stands out in, in the church of Ephesus was the lack of love. It's called a loveless church. Now, picture this. Early on, Paul spent two or three years preaching in that city. You say, well, what was the city like? A couple of centuries later, the city of London had about 30,000 people. At the time of Paul, it's estimated there were 250,000 people in the city of Ephesus. It was the center of worship of Artemis, who was a goddess for the Greeks, and then eventually the name changed, and it was great as Diana of the Ephesians, and so on, and Corinth, and wherever. A pagan city with many pagan practices that uh, are mind-boggling and shocking, although not as shocking today in our communities as it might have been when you and I were a lot younger. Hmm, there you go. Now, Church of Ephesus. I'm just going to read a little word from it here. To the angel, the messenger of the Ephesus rite, these things he had he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the middle of the seven golden lamps. I know your works. He knows everything your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. This is wonderful. They're, 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 they're strong in their message. They're strong in their work. They're fervent. They're persevering in that. You tested those who are apostles. Some of them they found to be liars. You know those things, and, and you've done a great job with it. And you haven't got tired. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. Apostle Paul was there for two or three years. Following on that, at some point in time, the next pastor or bishop of the area was Timothy. And Paul's message to Timothy was, keep going. Don't succumb to the persecutions that are going on and which may affect you directly and don't be scared of what's happening because it's worth it what we do. The kingdom of God is growing. Now, 45 years later approximately, because that was approximately in A.D. 53, so 20 years perhaps after Christ had risen. And now it's the book of Revelation, we believe was written about A.D. 90, 95. So we're talking 45, 50 years later, something had happened to these churches. 
It seems the persecution, the difficulties, the poverty, the suffering in a, in a, in a city, in a country that is totally given over to the worship of satanic images. <clears throat> Getting people down and you've lost your first love. What does that mean? It probably means to me that they're going through the same kind of ritual and processes that they always do. They go to the church, they read, sing their hymns, they make an offering, but it's not with the same heart that they had early on. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all these churches. I just want to pick out a little bit of the good and the bad, and then we're going to jump over to something that I think might be shocking for many of us. So they hated, hated evil, they were tireless workers, they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I'm going to be talking about the Nicolaitans. How many know what the Nicolaitans were? Nobody. <laughs> when did you last read your Bible? I'm teasing you. <laughs> I didn't know about the Nicolaitans until I really started to dig into it. Yeah, well, we'll get to that in a few minutes. So there's a sect, the Nicolaitans, that happened to be within the church. I don't get the picture that they were a large segment of the church, but they were there. And you, the majority or the number, even though you left your first love, you're doing one good thing, you hate the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So that was a, a star, a gold star in their favor. And of course, uh, we go on to the next church, Church of Smyrna. By the way, we bought some figs the other day at Costco. You know where they come from? Smyrna. That's what it says. Well, it doesn't say it comes from there, but they're Smyrna figs. So apparently that whole area is, is the greatest region in the whole world for growing figs. And that's the name of the figs. Oh, from Smyrna. Oh yeah, I'm going to talk about Smyrna here. And in verse, in chapter 2, Verse 8, and uh, it's writing to Smyrna. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation. It's all this tribulation. You remember when Paul was preaching there and people got so stirred up and they were, it, it was dangerous, dangerous times. And, and it wasn't because they loved uh, Diana or as it was the, the, the name of the, uh, the Greek goddess there, which was the same god, goddess. Uh, but because they were going to lose some of their income. These were the silversmiths and the, the people who created the ornaments and the things to sell to all the people coming to worship. That really upset them. And it was going to get very difficult for, obviously for Paul and for everyone for the next many, many years. So it says here, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty. Now this is interesting. But you are rich. I, I think they were in poverty. I think it was a troubling time, and uh, God has emphasized them to them right here and now. Yes, I can bless you with riches, I can bless you with comforts, but that's not what we're doing in these days. But you are rich because you have the gospel, you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. But there are a few problems you've got to take care of. Get with the program, folks. And when I look at these churches, remember I emphasized the time is near. We are in the same age as all of these churches were 2,000 years ago. It's the age of grace. So by reading these, we're telescoping down to our time to see that churches today are as they were then. And if Jesus were to write a letter to us, I suspect it would be virtually the same. But it doesn't condemn every church. And certainly doesn't talk about denominations, but you know what it really gets down to? The individuals in the church. So as we go through this list of seven churches of Revelation, I don't want you to say, oh, I know that church, I know what they're like, they're, they're pretty bad. And you can probably do that. But I'd rather that we search our own hearts and see, do we have the first love? Or individually, have we slipped a little bit? Is there anything we can do about it? 
And now we hear it here in the church of, uh, of Smyrna. Yes, sickness, struggling, perhaps poverty in some instances. But folks, you are rich. You're rich. Hallelujah. You're rich in Christ, in the gospel, in his promises, in our future. We shall reign as kings and priests with him forever and ever as we bring back our love and our faithfulness. Now I'll talk about that a little later on. Do not fear any of the things which you're about to suffer. I, indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested and be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. So there's Smyrna. By the way, when I was in Turkey, I had driven from India through to London, England. That's quite a while ago. Can't do that now, not, not the pathway that I took. And uh, we landed in, uh, of course, in the capital city. And I noticed there was a travel agency along the side of the road, quite near where the turkeys were, actually. And uh, I decided to go in and I wanted to find out how far it was to Ephesus. And I asked the girl in there, I said, well, can you give me a program or let me know how far it is to Ephesus? And she said, what, what are you talking about? What's, what's Ephesus? As you may know, that whole region is not 100%, but it's largely a Muslim area now. And there, in fact, is no population in Ephesus. Ephesus was destroyed probably through an earthquake and pillaging of different things. And, and the nearest towns are probably 15, 20 kilometers away. But at that time, it was one of the biggest uh, uh, population centers in the entire world. Isn't that incredible? And that's where God had led Paul to give some of his first sermons. Amazing. We move on to Pergamos, verse 12 to 17. These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. I don't think it's implying that Satan's throne was in the church or in the community of believers. But it was certainly in that place. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. Did not deny my faith. Even the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. Persecution. Murder. Who was killed among you where Satan dwells. It was a satanic cult throughout that whole region. But you were faithful. But I do have a few things against you. Because you have here those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I, which thing I hate. Okay, here we are with the Nicolaitans again. You know who Balaam was? Okay, Balaam was a prophet. And apparently he'd been a, a pretty good prophet. Uh, serving God but something happened first of all there was war at least tension between the country of Moab and Israel and uh, it, I don't think it tells us you know exactly uh, too much about Balaam but he was a servant of God he was a prophet of God and he always spoke things that those things came to pass and happened what he said happened the king of Moab noticed that and he said I'd like to send some messengers to you and, and just listen to what I have to say. What you say happens. If you curse something, it is cursed. If you bless it, it gets blessed. I will make it worth your while if you will curse Israel. You will be rich. You will be famous. Hmm. Balaam said, no, I, I can't do that. But I'll, I'll give consideration. I'll talk to the Lord about it. I'm going to pray. And when he finished, he said, no, can't do it. So the king of Moab sent another group of messengers to talk to Balaam. And uh, they were better dressed. They were higher officials in the kingdom of Moab. And maybe that prestige would impress him. And he said again, no, I, I can't do that. But I'll, I'll give it some consideration tonight and that. Uh, 
pray and you guys stay until morning and we'll talk about it then. He was compromising already. He knew what God wanted. He didn't have to think about it again. Does God have to tell us to be good twice? Or to mend our ways or to love people more than we, we, we have been doing? God has spoken. He said, well, okay. He succumbed. How, did, how is this all happening here? In, in 2 Peter 2.15 talks about Balaam, a prophet hired by Balaam, Balaam, the king of Moab, and it says he loved the wages of righteousness, willing to compromise, to conform to the world, thinking that the things of the world had more value for him than the things of God, and reigning with God in heaven. Well, there we are. Now, getting back to now, what is this uh, thing about the Nicolaitans? Well, it kind of tells us a bit about it, that first of all, uh, they were people who offered food to idols. And now that the church, many in the church, were compromising and they were knowingly eating things that had been offered to idols. Now, you and I might not think anything about that, but I uh, have to have to face that very clearly and directly in the country of Thailand, where I lived for well over 20 years. They offer to idols all the time, spirit worship, okay? Take some food out and, and then the, the monks or the Buddhist priests and whatnot will have, they'll bless the food and they'll <coughs> distribute it. I have to make decisions. If I participate in that food knowingly, the people who are watching me take food that was offered to idols are going to think in their hearts that I'm sympathizing with that practice, that I'm honoring these spirits. That's what they were faced with. And said, you've been, you've been, that's part of the Nicolaitan uh, belief system, and, and, and that's wrong. Uh, perhaps even worse than that were the immoral sexual practices that was going on because of this doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Nic Nicholas, they think, we don't know for sure. He may have been a, a, one of the early deacons in, in the church. And over a period of time, may have succumbed to the uh, conformation to the world. It's easier than fighting against it. It's, it's easier than preaching the gospel with fire and, and love at the same time. And, and that's where they were. God says, I hate that. And I hate that you love the wages of unrighteousness. Okay, repent, repent. And I have to search my heart while I was in Thailand and Africa and here in Canada or wherever else. I think we all have to search our hearts. Is my heart as clean as it should be? By the way, is there anybody here that has sinned today? Yeah, I think we probably all have. Well, put up your hand. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we didn't want to admit it. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm the same. I didn't want to admit it either. But either in thought, deed, lack of compassion, perhaps, failing to do good where I could have done good, we all sin. In fact, the Bible says if we say we have no sin, we're lying. Yeah, but I was cleansed. Absolutely. You are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. But we still have to wash our hands every day and take a shower and then again. And it's the same in the Spirit to get cleansed by washing of the water by the Word and the Holy Spirit flowing through us and renewing us. And that's what, that's what this whole message is about of the seven churches to be renewed, to be restored, to get back into the right place. Number four, Church of Thyatira. I know your works, there they are again, love, service, faith, patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. They, they, were, they were going for it, they were doing good. But I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel. What? I thought Jezebel was back in uh, the time of Elisha and Elijah. Why is she here? 
who calls herself a prophetess to teach and beguile my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. What in the world is this about? Well, I don't know that this gal's name was actually Jezebel, or is simply an imagery given to us so that we think back to the time of uh, King Ahab and Elijah. What, what was going on then, do you remember? It was all about the prophets of Baal. And Jezebel had killed most, uh, had them killed most of the prophets of the Lord, the servants of the Lord, most of them had been killed. That's why Elijah felt he was so alone, and I alone am here serving him. No, no, we've got, still got a few people around, God says to him. But what was Jezebel actually doing? She was following pagan religion of Baal. You've heard of that. It was one of the main uh, deities, gods, of the Canaanites were from Canaan. Canaan. All that area that we're talking about here where these churches are, the history was of the, the Canaanites or the Phoenicians. You've heard of them. I heard about them when I was in school. All I knew is that they had a ship. That's all I remember from history at that time. And they were good at their uh, marine activities. But it goes a lot deeper and we learn a lot more. They were deep into two kinds of worship. Child sacrifice. You heard of that? Why, why were they doing it? Well, Baal and, and some of the deities related were actually uh, gods of, of uh, prosperity, gods of uh, fertile ground, gods of rain, you see, they're, they're in an area which doesn't have the well, wells, the natural wells that, that they have in many places. Then they had to rely on, on rain, just like we're trying to rely on it right now. And we're getting pretty frustrated that we don't have enough. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and so that's what they did. They would take their firstborn, and there's that idol, and they would place the idol... Uh, on a kind of a dish-shaped thing in the uh, in, in this image, and the poor little child would roll down into the fire. Mm. First born. Do we do that these days? You know, they were concerned. Well, in, in fact, what it boils down to, they were doing it with the hopes that they would prosper. Right? They they needed their ground to be watered. They, didn't, they couldn't suffer through uh, more uh, lack of rain and dryness of the ground. So they were hoping for prosperity to come through this great sacrifice of the firstborn. Well, I don't know anybody who's doing that these days, but we do sacrifice children. For what reason? Maybe the same reason. I can't, uh, I can't afford to have another child. I've got three or four, whatever it happens to be, I can't afford another. In the United States alone, in the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years, maybe longer, there's approximately 60 million babies have been murdered through lawful abortion. I, 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 I told you, I said, look, we have the same problems, essentially, that they had back then, just taking a different shape. Another thing about Jezebel, have you ever heard of the Ashtoreth? Anybody? Yes, I, I know that uh, you guys have. Okay. Uh, it, it was, um, the whole thing rotated around worship in their pagan temple, where there was sodomy going on between adherence to the temple and priests and priestesses that were in the temple. In other words, lustful, unlawful, sexual, sensuous practices. And one of the main uh, symbols that they had was a pole called the Ashtoreth. Joash, one of the kings, his father had this Ashtoreth. 
Now, he was worshiping the pagan gods. Remember back in time when Moses, Joshua, comes into the Canaan and he is told to get rid of all these pagan people who are worshiping these evil gods. He didn't do it. The people didn't do it. He did his job, went to heaven, but those that followed did not complete the job. In fact, that was part of the secret with Moab and, uh, and our poor friend uh, Balaam. He said, I want to get rid of these Israelites. I want to get them to compromise. I can't get them to do it by just money and give gifts to them. So I know how we'll do it. Uh, convince them that it's okay to get sweet on some of these beautiful Moab girls. And uh, sure enough, that's what happened. And it compromised uh, the country. And, that, and eventually, uh, just like Solomon, hey, Solomon, wisest man in the world, pretty stupid sometimes. I mean, what are you, 700 wives and three, 300 concubines or vice versa, that's a lot. But it turned his heart towards their religions. Hey, turn their heart, compromise, giving in, succumbing to these temptations. And sure enough, uh, lo and behold, before very long, uh, Joash, his father, the king of Israel at that time, had his own Ashtoreth and worship going on like that. Joash stood out because he smashed down the Ashtoreth of his father. Hallelujah. And he then became the king of Israel at that time. So, Christ is saying to the church in, uh, in Thyatira, I have these things against you because uh, you've got these things among you and you're tolerating them. You're tolerating them. Well, do we have any Ashtoreth uh, in our nation, Western nations these days? Well, I'm told that we do. Dancing poles. I know it's different, but the same thing is the same thing. Again, it's to feed the lustful cravings and depravity of uh, whole generations of people. You don't know what I'm talking about, I know. Well, Go on to Sardis, number five, and that's from uh, chapter three, and verses one to six. I know your works, there it is again, you've been doing something, it, 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 this is great. You have a name, you're alive, but you are dead. What in the world? My wife and I were traveling, can't remember exactly from where, probably from the Okanagan down through Merritt quite a few years ago. And I happened to know the church in Merritt because it was on top of a haystack in Nicola that I came to the Lord, made my confession of faith when I was a kid. Coming through Merritt, I had known about the church, the Pentecostal church. So we decided it's right along the road where we're going into the town of Merritt and we'd stop there for the evening service on Sunday. There was a visiting evangelist from the States and uh, he was talking about the church that he had. It was a, a, a good church, I think it was California, and uh, they had all kinds of programs and uh, specials all the time and special speakers and programs of one sort and another and lighting systems to make the young people enjoy it, you know, be like a club or a bar or something like that and they like the glistening lights. And uh, all kinds of programs, he said. He said, you know, we were one of the most uh, attractive, had the most attractive programs of any churches in the area. And he said, we were dead. We were dead. It was lifeless. It was just, a, just going through the motions of religion. Just playing church. It, it, nothing was happening. People weren't getting saved. They weren't being filled with the Spirit. We were dead. Well, he wasn't dead any longer. And it, from what I listened to that night, uh, apparently they got the fire down there in that church and changed everything. So my friends, sometimes I think we need more of that. Do we not? Amen. We don't want to be dead. We don't even want to have a name that we're alive but we're dead. No, no. I, I want to see living bodies living for Christ. And they say that uh, people are really, you know, if you're going to be on fire for God, people will come and see what the fighter's all about. Praise God. 
Okay, well, we're getting there. So that's the dead church. The faithful church. That, now, this is not the only decent uh, performing church in this whole uh, list of churches. But this really stands out. These things who is whole, says he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts no one opens, I know your works, yes. See, I have shut before it, I have set before you an open door, no one can shut it, have a little strength, yeah, you, you've got strength, I know it's difficult, you kept my word, have not denied my name, in other words, saying that a lot of people have, but you haven't. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not but lie. Okay, there, there was some kind of a sect in there, and uh, it, but it was again spiritually not Christian. I will make them come and worship at your feet. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. What in the world is that about? Well, the Jews suffered persecution, certainly the churches, the destruction of Jerusalem, the diaspora, the scattering of Jews throughout the world until they had no nation that you could really put your hands on at that time. But again, telegraphing down to our time, there is an hour that will be coming upon the earth. It's going to be terrible. It'll be dramatic. There will be suffering. Christians will suffer as they've never suffered, probably in all of history. It's not going to be pretty. And it wasn't pretty then. He said, I know your works, and you've kept my command. And I will keep you from the hour of trial. What is that talking about? I will keep you from it implying that some of those other churches they're not being kept from it or let's make it down more personal some of us will not go through that trial that hour of trial but some will that's the implication of what it's saying here is it not tribulation you've heard of the tribulation it's coming we're getting much closer than you might think i'm going to skip down quickly to the Laodicea, and these things say, the man, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my, my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I become wealthy, I have need of nothing. Comfortable. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. It says one place in scripture. But you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now listen to this. I think it's, it's when we first do a cursory, superficial reading of this, there's a lot of condemnation here for most of these churches. But look a little deeper. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, you're loveless, but I love you. Smyrna, persecuted, suffering, don't forget it. I love you. Church at Pergamos with the Balaamites, compromised with pagan practices, I love you. Thyatira with that Jewish, and the, the, with Jezebel, all these horrible practices, child sacrifice, our nation, child sacrifice, Asherah poles, lustful, I love you. I love you. Hallelujah. Church of Sardis dead, but I love you. I love you. I'm going to come back to 
Philadelphia just for a moment. Do you know that our nation at its beginning, almost like a covenant nation under God? Did you know that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is part of the Constitution of Canada, uplifts the name of God? Did you know that? If you knew that, please raise your hand. Here's part of what it says. The Canadian nation is founded upon principles that acknowledge the supremacy of God. It's right in our Constitution. Similar to the United States in God we trust. Nation under God. I don't hear our Prime Minister ever mentioning the name of Christ. I do know that uh, if you don't approve of their policy on abortion, you cannot be a member of their cabinet. Hey, what's going on? Something under the surface that we don't see. He's a good speaker. I mean, he's a fantastic speaker. You think he's the most wonderful guy in the world? And as a person, so he may be. But he's amongst those who are declining and taking away rights, liberties of our Christian faith. Well, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a fallen away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, destruction. And this is perversive, pervasive throughout our world today. The leaders especially the Western countries, they can't run away from God fast enough. I guess because when they think of God, their heart condemns them. They don't want God. There's a whole organization, I forget the name of it right now, which is trying to get this phrase, the supremacy of God, removed from the Constitution. Did you know that? Yes. In 2008, there was a a poll taken in Canada to see how many people believe, what percentage of the population believed in God. 23%. I said, sorry, 80, 80 some odd percent. 23% who said they do not believe in any God. And based on that 20 some odd percent, this organization is saying, because of that, why are we still saying that God should be supreme in our nation? And those are the kinds of undertow currents that are trying to drag our country down into being a pagan country again. So what should we expect going forward in time? And my time is just about done. I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but I want you to know that some of the, how do, how do we know what to expect going forward? What, what, is it, what is this tribulation about? Are we going to experience it? I'd say yes, some of us will. I, I think throughout history, since the time of Paul, each generation has looked forward with hope that this would introduce the second advent of Jesus Christ. But it hasn't happened. But things are coming together. They're meshing together. There's this undercurrent that we don't see on the surface. It looks so wonderful and relatively peaceful, but underneath it's rotten to the core. I can tell you one thing that I have studied on, and, and, and I know this to be a fact. There are plans for many of the Western and other nations to create a new economic system. Did you know that? The ambition is to have a new world order. Did you know that? Did you know that our own Prime Minister, a few months ago, he was kind of, he said, one good thing is coming out of this pandemic. We will be able to have a great reset. Did you hear that? Did you yeah. see it? What in the world is he talking about? As far as I know, he's never explained what he meant. I, I could quote a few others. It, to me, it's, it's really scary. But uh, right now, they are doing away with cash in China. No 
yuan dollars, no Hong Kong dollars. Did you know that? You're getting rid of it. They're going to, not a cryptocurrency, but a digital, digital currency. So you won't have, you know, look, look, the pandemic is kind of helping this along because there are stores that will not accept cash. Have you been to a store that won't accept cash? I, 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 this is just a little tip of the iceberg, but you can see it beginning to happen. And because China is now using this exclusive digital currency in their largest cities such as Beijing and uh, Shanghai and a couple of other places as a test, they want to beat the United States to the draw on this thing. They want to be the nation of the world. They want to be at the top of the pile. So, a little late, but recently the United States Congress has approved and Pelosi to work on a federal digital currency. Now, with massive commuter, computers and what they call the uh, blockchain, have you heard of that? Blockchain? It's a system of the computerization that you've had a little problem with your computer. It's, it's more powerful than they did when they went to the moon uh, back in the 50s or 60s the first time, or get into outer space, okay? That's what your computer is. This is 100,000 or a million times more powerful, this blockchain chain thing. And therefore, it comes, now China, I have no doubt about it, they want to have to know what's going on with your money or their money over there every last penny so you go and make a purchase they know you made that purchase you can't slip anything under the table because it's all computerized and they know where that money is going at any moment of time you can't take a whole bunch out and store it in under your bed can't do that can't bury it in your backyard can't do that they know constantly where your money is. Eventually, it may be that everyone will be born with a certain amount of uh, money to start with as a digital currency, and that is monitored through the, your life. And if you're fat and you go and buy some uh, junk food, uh, you may be, not, may be denied. No, you can't do that. That's wasteful. I don't know if they'll do that, but they could because they will be able to identify every transaction of money exchange. Wow. That, that's, that's not my imagination. This is happening right now. How soon will it be worldwide? I don't know. But already Saudi Arabia, uh, I believe uh, a few nations in the Middle East, are using the digital currency of China to buy and sell oil. How do you like them apples? It's happening. And what does that lead to? Well, it leads to a, eventually a new, a new world order where somebody, a tyrant of some sort, is going to rise to the top. And believe me, I've thought about this a lot. If I were not a Christian and I was watching the population explode as it is and the, the problems that are happening, pandemic things happening which never happened before and to this degree in all of history, it couldn't because travel didn't happen instantly as it does now. They didn't have airplanes back in Paul's day. It took months or years to cross the Atlantic over to a place where they didn't even know existed. But now, same day, uh, a virus can be spread to another country just like that. We need somebody in charge. Because all nations are going helter skelter one way or the other. In fact, in, in Thailand, which was uh, a wonderful example of surviving with the pandemic for about a year, uh, they hardly had any of it. Now they're one, one of, they're being assaulted in one of the worst uh, virus situations that you can imagine. So many people are dying. Uh, they they cremate over there, usually in the temple, and the temples are turning people away, and some of them are just throwing their loved ones into the bush. Hmm. It's bad. Somebody's got to take charge. And they will. They will. 
Another thing that's going to happen is there's going to be an attack on Israel. Well, you say, that's nothing new. That's nothing new at all. It gets very serious. The Bible prophesied that Russia and Turkey and Iran and Persia are going to gang up on a mighty assault on Israel. That has not happened to this moment in time. But Russia is sidled up closely to Iran, no doubt to assist them with their uh, nuclear program, which uh, they had agreed they would not proceed with. And yeah, okay, and uh, other nations getting ready. I, I tell you, it it's mind-boggling, and that's why I said it's a bit scary to look at this. When we look a little deeper, there, there's a, a, a major country or city. Most uh, prophetic people were in the past thought it was going to be Rome, that it was going to be Mystery Babylon. You've heard of that, Mystery Babylon? Well, there was a real Babylon <coughs> under the, at Nebuchadnezzar and certainly destroyed, uh, you know, his, his group destroyed Israel and eventually let them go back. But now we're talking about a new Babylon, a mystery Babylon, the most prosperous grouping of people in the history of the world. Destroyed in an hour. That's not my imagination, this is scripture. And I'm going to read it to you from Revelation chapter 18, just for a second or two. Let me stop. Can you handle this? I'm going to go to chapter 18, verse 16. I'm going to start with 15. The merchants of these things who became rich by her, rich by the, this uh, Babylon, new Babylon, mystery Babylon, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment. So much destruction, they don't want to come near it weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, there's never been anything like it in the history of the world, the greatest nation or grouping of people in history, destroyed in an hour. There's destruction happened to all kingdoms and governments in the past. But only now in our generation, maybe since the 50s, has it become possible to do that in a single hour. Some people believe that uh, because there's no nation like it, it's the richest in history, the most successful, the most powerful in the world today, United States of America. Some people say, well, it, they're a Christian nation. <laughs> there are many Christians there, and I thank God for them. There, there's this undercurrent again, friends. Potentially, I'm not prophesying that that is, because maybe it's 100, 200 years from now and there's another nation. But it seems pretty likely that we're talking about some of the greatest nations in the world today. And one of them is going to be destroyed in an hour. By the way, if it's the States, I think that uh, I wouldn't want to be in Toronto. Maybe Ottawa, so that's okay. <laughs> that's supposed to be a sack, a sick joke. <laughs> I don't wish that on anybody, but it's coming. Tribulation. And then I go back to this wonderful promise that was made to the faithful church, Philadelphia. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour there it is again, the hour of trial, Amen. which shall come upon the whole world. Now, not just Israel, the whole world. The whole world. God knew how big the world is. Nobody else knew. God knew the whole world. To test those who dwell on earth, and then the words, Behold, I come quickly. Is this possibly talking about a rapture? faithful, whose lives are clean, in line with the command to get it right, repent, come back, be faithful, get the first love, 
be fearless in the face of persecution. Have you ever had persecution? I've had a little bit. Nothing to write home about. I graduated from high school in 1959, and maybe 20 years later, I would happen to be in contact with one of my fellow classmates who'd been in the same school for 11 or 12 years with me. Do you know the first thing he said to me on the phone? He said, are you still a religious nut? <laughs> After 20 years, are you still a nut for religion? I don't think I ever preached to him even once. Maybe there was something else that was going on that he was being uh, resistant and, and, and uh, kicking against the pricks, so to speak. I don't know. Well, I guess that was persecution that was pretty light. But I've also been in India, where there was a radical Hindu group, and I had 20,000 people in the crowd, and the word was circulated, they're going to kill you tonight. Yeah, that felt more like persecution, especially when I learned that a couple of months previous, two Christian evangelists, native Indians, had been murdered by the same group. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. I don't want to particularly go through the tribulation. I'd rather be caught up in the rapture. Yeah. <laughs> I will keep you from the hour of trial. So either by death or by rapture, it is possible and available to be kept from this hour of trial which is going to come on the whole world. Are you with me? What's your place? <laughs> What's mine? I have one more word. Very short. Life today is like two sides of a coin. And I learned this from a Thai evangelist on YouTube. It's very simple. There are two sides to every coin. And we are used to looking at the side that looks pretty good. Everything is good. It's not that bad. We've got things under control. Yeah, well, we'll take care of that problem. We'll take care of the fires. We'll take care of the vaccines. We'll take care of, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, get our people back from China. Uh, the unrighteousness there, the, the imprisonment of perhaps hundreds of thousands of Christians in work camps in China. Uh, maybe we'll be able to take care of that. And uh, what about the killing of, of Christians in some of the Muslim, radical Muslim areas? Revelation 22, 20. Surely, I am coming quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Very much, Dawn, for that very powerful word. At this